Hi everyone, can you hear me? Okay, thank you very much for attending our session. Um, uh, today, UG and I are going to talk about uh, how to apply policy-based governance and ensure the integrity of policies. So I'll be talking a little bit about what we mean by policy-based governance and the concepts and stuff. And then UG will go into more details on what is the approach to enable integrity and also do a short demo. Uh, just to quickly introduce ourselves, um, I am a distinguished engineer at Red Hat and have been working in the security, compliance, and governance space for many years now. And UG here is at IBM Research in Tokyo and he has also been working in the security space for a long time. Okay, let me um, talk a little bit about what do we mean by policy-based governance and what are the various aspects about it. So first of all, you know, why do we need it? So if you think about a uh, Kubernetes-based cloud platform, uh, enterprises that use it have to operate it to meet various controls, uh, enterprise standards, both internal standards that their CISO sets, as well as external standards like regulatory compliance standards, PCI, HIPAA, et cetera. So, and you want to be able to accomplish uh, meeting those goals with the minimal uh, operational cost. So applying the policy-based governance approach uh, enables you to do that because you are uh, providing a, a more automated way of accomplishing these goals. So what do we really mean by policy-based governance? What we mean is that if you look at a particular um, cloud platform that is being managed, whether it is uh, on-prem or whether it is hosted in the cloud, there are various personas involved in, uh, in using that platform. You know, there are application developers who are running workloads on that platform. There are site reliability engineers and administrators who need to operate it to meet security, resiliency, and software engineering standards. And there are SecOps for folks who are worried about the security aspects of the platform. And there are compliance engineers who have to produce evidence for audits and they're dealing with auditors for various regulatory compliance standards. And then you also have the CISO who also sets their own standards as well. So you have to deal with the CISO security architects as well. So you, are, you have uh, all these different personas who are involved. And, and how do we ensure that those personas are collaborating on a more day-to-day -day basis as opposed to just scrambling during audits and so on? So that's really what um, policy-based governance uh, allows you to accomplish. And let's talk about how. The how is, how do we do this is you represent best practices as policies. And these policies are stored in a repository like Git. And they are managed just like source code. And they are deployed using GitOps methodology. And then um, any violations are detected and routed to you know, incident management tools so that you can either automatically remediate those violations or you, you at least have automated opening of service tickets and so on. And then you can also fine tune the policies to based on um, the day-to-day -day experience. So that's really what we mean um, in terms of how we want to do this. And then what are the benefits of taking this approach? One of the key benefits is reduction of the operational cost. Because if you think about it, um, the people who are really managing the platform are necessarily not the experts in all aspects. So they may not know, you know exactly how to enable various security controls or resiliency controls and so on. By actually representing those best practices as policies that are managed like source code, now you can have the correct SMEs actually authoring those policies and reviewing them and approving them in Git. So that is how it, the operational cost for the SRE and the admins are reduced. And it also, by taking this approach, you're also doing this on a day-to-day -day basis so that you have a continuous view of how your security posture is, how is your compliance posture by taking this approach, at least for the controls for which you have enabled this. And, um, and as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's really important for the day-to-day -day collaboration to happen among the various personas, because typically, you know, today what happens is the collaboration happens kind of when there is an audit, you know, and you're getting ready to prepare for the audit, that's when, you know, everybody starts talking and, you know, trying to figure out what to do, right? 
But if you kind of had that collaboration happening through the GitOps methodology on a day-to-day -day basis, then it becomes more efficient and you can really achieve the goal of continuous security and audit readiness. So as part of the Kubernetes policy work group, uh, we, have, we last year published a white paper on policy management, which um, had this architecture that talks about the various uh, building blocks that you need. The policy administration point is where the policies uh, get pulled in and deployed across the various managed clusters. And then on the managed clusters, you have the policy decision point as well as the various policy engines, which act as policy enforcement points that can actually apply those uh, various policies. So you can look up our white paper there. And we also did a panel session last year at KubeCon, and we're doing another session this year. Anka here is in the room. Uh, she's part of that activity. And uh, come and see us at KubeCon. We are going to have a follow-up panel session on this topic. And then I also wanted to highlight that um, in terms of applying this approach, we do have an open cluster management CNCF sandbox project that has the building blocks needed to apply the policy-based governance approach. And uh, it has this policy add-on component that enables that capability. And some key aspects there are the ability to have templatized policies so that you can, uh, for edge scalability, you don't have to deploy that many policies if you need to customize things on specific clusters. And it also has this capability called policy generator that allows you to take existing policies, whether it is um, OPA or um, QNO and so on, and then and, and even just regular Kubernetes configuration and convert them to apply uh, compliance and other metadata to uh, deploy them to the managed clusters. And then we also have this concept called policy sets that allow you, allows you to group policies for ease of management, whether you, know, you can group policies by PEPs or you can group policies based on specific aspects like security, residency, et cetera. We also have a policy collection repo where we invite community collaboration to build out these policies. And um, so take a look at that as well. So the, with this approach, the key is since now we are managing best practices as policies and you are driving the desired configuration state on your clusters using this policy-based approach, it, then policies become very critical because now they can actually set how your clusters are operating. So that is why the integrity of policies is extremely important because it is a very powerful mechanism. So I'm going to turn it over to Yuji so he can take us through the details of how do we apply integrity, et cetera. Thank you, Jay. Okay. I'm, I'm Yuji Watanabe from uh, IAM Research. The, so the, as Jay mentioned, the, uh, Policy is really important piece. So the integrity of policy is really important. If the policy is compromised, the total cluster has the damage. So the approach to protect the policy is a signature. The, so by using a signature, we can uh, allow us to check the uh, policy integrity uh, and, uh, and uh, control the, the policy who can define the policy. But the question is, uh, policy, uh, this is a policy for governing the uh, total Kubernetes uh, system. So the question is how we can use this policy mechanism to enable the integrity of the policy. That is the question. And uh, covering, uh, I am trying to cover the in this talk. So the So the approach is like this. So the first uh, uh, policy is signed. Uh, I will explain how the policy is signed. Uh, the policy basically signed. Then it's uh, delivered but to the hub, uh, hub cluster. Then it's de deployed to the managed cluster. And uh, on the managed cluster, we put the admission controller to check the uh, signature of the policy. Then if the policy is uh, modified, the admission of the policy is blocked. And uh, so the, this is a mechanism of the overall approach of the protecting the integrity. So the uh, OK, 
Okay, so that this is policy signing. So actually, the, uh, the how we can can we sign the policy? The policy uh, the the tool is available on the six tool uh, six tool. tool the, it's called uh, K8S manifest six tool. Uh, this is uh, uh, works as a plugin for the kubectl command. And by using this command, uh, uh, some if you run this command, the si signature annotation is attached on the uh, policy. So the, this is uh, uh, encoded uh, um, message, message body and the signature, uh, encoded by uh, signature. So the, this is a signing mechanism. So then, I, I, I will type this. Okay. okay. So the uh, enforcement side is uh, we use admission controller. The, we actually uh, published a project called Integrity Shield. This is uh, admission control for the signature uh, manifest signature, and this works with the OPA gatekeeper and uh, the provide it provides a webhook API backend. Uh, and also, the uh, recent in the latest release, uh, we uh, we worked with uh, Kiberno team to enable the, this YAML signing capability, sign signature verification capability on Kiberno. So, the, by using the, this YAML manifest signature verification uh, enforcement, uh, uh, we can block the admission of the policy, uh, uh, which is uh, compromised, or even after the uh, admission, the, uh, this the tool can be used to check the, uh, the, the policies in the cluster, so it uh, continuously. So the, this is an uh, enforcement mechanism. Thank you. And, uh, but uh, by the question is how this uh, mechanism can be deployed, can be en enabled on the uh, large number of the uh, managed cluster. So for deploying the, uh, this uh, admission control integrity shield, uh, we use uh, uh, policy. So actually the integrity shield policy is used to deploy the integrity shield uh, admission control on the managed cluster. Then uh, the also we have the two different policy. Called, uh, one is for the detecting the uh, uh, deny admission event to the cluster. So we can detect the uh, what kind of the admission request is actually blocked by, with, uh, by because of the uh, BART signature. And we have another uh, mechanism called observer policy. So it works with integrity shield to check the uh, existing or existing resources are, are matching with uh, uh, policy. So, so by using these three policies, uh, and the, these policies are deployed by the, the uh, OCM mechanism, then the managed cluster integrity of the policy is protected on the managed cluster. And this is an uh, example. So the first, uh, uh, this is uh, if the policy, this is a command to, to check the uh, policy on the cluster. So all policies, three policies, integrity policy, the event policy, observer policy, uh, or the state is compliant. Then, uh, then could you? Okay, so then, uh, then uh, let's assume the, uh, we create some uh, sample policy. So sample policy is, uh, is not signed. So in, then I try to deploy this sample policy to the target cluster by you have. But uh, if it's uh, loaded to have, then have pushed the, that the SIP policy to the managed cluster. But uh, protection at the managed cluster, uh, its integrity sheet, it actually detects the uh, signature violation and reports the comp uh, com uh, reports non-compliant. So in this case, uh, so integrity events policy uh, reports the compliant, uh, non-compliant. This means some uh, deny event is coming to the cluster. So this is why, this is because uh, the sample policy is does not have the uh, proper signature. So if the signature is later, if the signature is properly attached, then 
ad admit is admission request coming again, then the uh, state becomes uh, 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 compliant. Uh, okay, so so for that, uh, uh, use uh, uh, six to uh, zero uh, QCT plugin to create the uh, YAML signing, then apply uh, the policy to the uh, cluster. The, uh, so the so this tool generates uh, uh, attach the annotation to the original uh, uh, policy. The, so the, this is attached the annot new YAML file which, which has annotated, uh, annotated signature annotation. Then uh, in this case, uh, uh, it's coming to the cluster, then the, it, the policy becomes uh, compliant. Okay. Okay, so this, uh, I talked about the how the uh, signature enforcement and uh, signature verification can be enabled by using the policy mechanism. Uh, another question is uh, the, if the one cluster has, is, is used for the signing uh, something, so for example, actually the policy signing, so in that case, the uh, signature must be delivered to that cluster. So this, this, uh, this is a proposal, one proposed approach to use the uh, uh, board uh, connected to the hub cluster. Uh, then the, the signing key is stored in the board. Then by using policy mechanism, the key is delivered through the hub, by, uh, but uh, this delivery is done by the encrypted encryption. So the uh, key is securely delivered to the tar target cluster. So by using this, the uh, uh, key is not stored in the, this cr cluster directly and uh, no need to manage the direct connection between the board and the cluster. So how can be the uh, kind of the secret delivery distribution hub for uh, distributing the, the secret to the target cluster like the si signing key. So the, for this, uh, we again, we use the uh, policy mechanism. So the uh, design is like this. So the, uh, on the, uh, we use the uh, external secret operator, so which the enables us to bring the uh, secret on the board to the uh, cluster, uh, cluster secret uh, automatically by using the, uh, th that automation is provided by the uh, external secret operator. So, so external secret operator, uh, we use the external secret operator. Another uh, building block is a policy template. The, it's, uh, uh, we can define the policy, but the policy has a template. So some template can, uh, ha, can encrypt uh, some value in the policy and deliver to the target. Uh, we can deliver the value to the target cluster sec securely. So by combining these two approach, we can enable the kind of the secret distribution hub idea. So first, uh, 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 two, uh, two policy, we use two policy. First one is, uh, of course, the policy template uh, to deliver the uh, secret on the hub to the target cluster. Uh, then the second one is uh, policy for the external secret. Uh, the, this, e so this policy is used to create the external secret on the hub cluster. Then uh, secret, this, this, uh, this external secret res custom resource is created. Uh, uh, external secret operator automatically uh, loads the uh, key from, from the board to the target hub cluster. Then this secret is loaded into the policy template. Then uh, this is delivered in the encrypted form. So the, uh, so the, this is an example of the template, uh, policy template uh, example. So the, this is a uh, policy. Uh, then uh, here the, you can see the template. Uh, the, this means the hub, uh, the, some secret on the hub is loaded into the here, and, but, but it must be encrypted on the uh, secret. Uh, so, it's, so basically the hub and the managed cluster ha uh, has a common secret for encrypting the data. So, by, so the template, template engine 
on the hub cluster, actually loads the secret on the, on the, on the hub, then uh, encrypt, the, encrypt and embed the de value here. So as you can see, so the DC is encrypted, so the value, then the, so basically this policy is delivered to the target cluster, so but the policy itself has, doesn't leak the secret uh, because this is encrypted. Then if this, uh, this the policy, encrypted policy goes to the managed cluster, uh, this part is decrypted by using the uh, common shared uh, secret key on the, uh, on the managed cluster side. So that's the mechanism of the deployment. Okay, okay so the, uh, this is a uh, final page. So uh, we uh, propose the, the, in this talk the, uh, how we can e protect the integrity of the policy. Uh, by using the uh, policy, mechanism, policy mechanism. So the signing and the enforcement and the monitoring and the key, the key distribution uh, is uh, covered. And uh, so we have the several talk related to, the, to this session, the, this, this, this talk. The, uh, we, uh, in, the, in this afternoon, the, we have the uh, another se another session of the Kibel Yamil Yamil Maribes signing verification uh, on the Kibel no. This is in a way the new release. The, this is the joint joint present presentation with Jim Baguaria, and the second one is the uh, Jay mentioned the, the policy uh, governance uh, talk is the uh, main uh, Kibelcom session, and the last one is uh, we are. Uh, we uh, talk about uh, how this manifest signing and enforcement can be enabled in the CD GitOps scenario. So, so we have several, so, so if you are interested, please come, come and join us. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see that you uh, apply your basic uh, technology now in uh, synergy with uh, other platforms that badly need this, this capability. I was wondering if you could share with us what you have next in the roadmap because it looks fantastic. Uh, thank you, Anka. Um, yeah, so what we have in our roadmap, so, so what we talked about what UG talked in detail was how to protect policies with integrity, right? But then the other talk also, we ex expanded that work and we are applying it to any Kubernetes resources. So it could, it could be application artifacts and such. So, so this is essentially a broader concept than that. So now what we are also doing is to apply this for uh, automation aspects, right? So you take, you have Ansible that is used for automation. Now we can also sign uh, Ansible playbooks. Because if you think about it, when I talked about policy-based governance, when you detect a violation, you want to be able to auto-remediate violations. So you may kick off an automation to do it. So how do you ensure that that automation is also uh, has protected with integrity? So we have, in fact, uh, there was a presentation last week, I, I believe in Ansible Fest, where we talked about that, um, protecting um, integrity of Ansible playbooks. So we have, we are basically applying this whole concept so that the full life cycle is protected, right? And and we want to have a consistent approach to do that. Okay, am I correct in thinking, I'm not too familiar with these policies, am I correct in thinking that say you didn't sign the policy, you didn't protect it, um, and a person, a hacker got in and uh, modified that policy. It's not that doing that would allow them to do things they otherwise couldn't do, because RBAC and things like that would be in, in effect. It's just that the management, technical management, wouldn't be notified that a policy had been violated. So basically you'd be shutting down the warning system by changing the policy to allow something that management typically wouldn't let them do. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. 
-hmm. Yeah, and I think uh, to add to that, right, um, you are essentially using policies to define how your managed clusters are configured. Right, and some of the configuration could be related to security and stuff. Right, so I agree with you that you know on Git itself, where the policies are managed as close, you still have those governance mechanisms around RBAC and such. And this is adding another layer to it to ensure that by a mistake or you know incorrectly, you know you're not changing some configuration that now results in your security controls not operating to the standards that you want, right? So that's right. Is there another question? Guess not. Thank you very much for attending. <laughs>